As a director, I hope to take you on a journey into a story to transform your mind and your feelings into those of the characters on, on screen. I want you to feel their outrage, their terror, their joy, their excitement. And in order to do that, I have to transform the story from the page to the screen. 14 years ago, I was a producer on a show called The X-Files. I had been producing for about 10 years. And I was taking directing classes on the side, and I studied acting because I wanted to learn how to become, uh, what actors go through. But for the most part, I was focused on producing. And I liked it. And then one day, my grandmother passed away. And my mom was going through her things. And she found a letter I had written her. And I wrote in this letter that I had just seen a film. And I thought it was wonderful. And I hope someday I can direct a film as well as that. Now, unfortunately, I didn't include the title of the film in the letter. But I did date it. I was 13 years old. So I went to the producers of The X-Files, and I asked if I could direct. And they said yes. And they gave me some advice. They said, always make sure the camera's telling the story. See the movie in your head. Be prepared. And be prepared for everything to change. And I remember that first day I went to set, and I saw the trucks and the trailers and the cast and the crew, and I was terrified. But I soon realized that I love directing. Now, when you're directing, it starts with an idea and then becomes a screenplay. And I've been fortunate to work with some brilliant writers. And the writer of that first episode that I directed was Vince Gilligan. And Vince Gilligan went on to create Breaking Bad, which changed my life. Great writing inspires directors and actors and crew to take it to the next level in transforming your story from the page to the screen. Now, once we have a script, I break it down. I see the movie in my head. I think about whose point of view do we want to be in? Whose story are we telling? What's the feeling we want to evoke? And where do I want to put the camera to make that a reality? I do shot lists and floor plans and storyboards. And sometimes, if we have huge visual effects, we'll work with a visual effects expert, and we'll do a computer-generated pre-visualization. And that's an animated mock-up of the entire scene before we've even shot it. This is an example of a storyboard. These storyboards are from George R. Martin's Game of Thrones. I worked with two amazing writers on that show that adapted it to television, D.B. Weiss and David Benioff. And these boards are from one of the first episodes I directed for them, called The Bear and the Maiden Fair. Now, just before I left for Northern Ireland, which is where the show is based, the producers called me and they said, Michelle, you've got a bear in your episode. There's three possible bears. There's one in Canada, there's one in Utah, and there's one in Europe. Would you be able to go to Utah this weekend and meet that bear? Absolutely. <laughs> so I called my sister, who's a veterinary ophthalmologist, and she came out and was my camera operator. She happens to live in Utah. And we went to uh, Doug Sue's house, who's the trainer, and Doug and his wife Lynn took us to the backyard to meet the bear. And little Bart was in a pond. And when he got out of the pond, I took two steps back. The only thing separating us was a thin wire that was about two feet off the ground. And he was huge. Dave, uh, Doug and I had talked about the scene ahead of time. And he said, you know, Michelle, we haven't had time to prepare much, but we've prepared a little something to show you. And he introduced me to Smitty, who was one of the other trainers. And Smitty picked up a cardboard sword. And this is a little bit of what they showed me. Go sleep. So flying is nice. Oh, it's boy. just so expensive for take it. production. Take it. Here, take yeah, this. I think they're talking about shooting it Bart, here. Take That's this. okay. In addition to that, Bart pretended that he was injured and he limped and he charged and he growled. He was amazing. And Doug told me that we could actually put Bart and the actors into the scene together. And I looked over at Smitty and I thought, hmm, he's tall and he's lean, and maybe if he shaved and put a wig on and a dress, he'd look a lot like. Gwendolyn Christie, who plays Brienne from the back and could be a great stunt double. 
And I thought, this is our bear. So we sent the footage to the producers and they agreed. But the only thing is it was too risky and expensive to send Bart to Northern Ireland. So what we decided to do is we'd shoot as much of the scene as we could in Belfast without the bear, and then we would shoot the bear portion back in the US at a later date. The art department built an amazing medieval castle set with a bear pit in it. And Will Simpson, the storyboard artist, and I created very detailed storyboards that showed exactly where the bear was, where he was looking, uh, so we could synchronize his eye line with the actors. Doug and I went through the storyboards to make sure we weren't asking the bear to do anything that he couldn't, and we made necessary adjustments. And then when we shot the Belfast portion, we used a performance artist to play the bear. And this was a guy who had metal prosthesis on his arms, and so he could walk on all fours and be the same height as the bear. So we shot the scene in Belfast, we cut it together, and we inserted the storyboards for the bear portion into the scene, and this is a little bit of what it looked like. Eyes above your lights. Be quiet. Is one shameful fucking performance. Stop running and fight. Now, months after we shot that, we flew to California, where the art department had recreated part of the bear pit in a Los Angeles parking lot. And Doug and Smitty and little Bart and Lynn drove in from Utah. And a few days before we shot the scene, the producers called and they said, Michelle, we're so sorry, but the insurance restrictions have changed and we can no longer put the bear and the actors in the pit at the same time. Now, we were always planning on doing green screen, and Smitty had agreed to put the wig and the dress on and he shaved. But we needed to establish the actors and the bear in the ring together. And we were planning on doing this practically. There is no computer generated bear at all in this scene. So we needed to come up with a new plan that didn't increase our visual effects budget. So Rob McLaughlin, our cinematographer and I got together, we brought in a storyboard artist and we came up with some new drawings and we put the plan into motion. Now on the first day, Doug said to the crew, Okay, everybody, there's no food on set, there's no yelling, there's no running, and everybody has to participate. And what that meant was every time Bart did something right, right reaction or action, whether it was charging or growling or leaping or whatever it was, the entire crew, grips, cameras, electrics, all cheered. And we'd all go, good boy, Bart, good boy. So for two days, the crew cheered. And it made for a really fun and entertaining shoot. Now on the last day, we were getting very close to finishing, and there was a key shot we absolutely needed. And as we were setting up, Bart suddenly turned and he started to walk towards his trailer, which was open on the side of the set. It was winter time, which means hibernation time, and he was tired and he wanted to go hibernate. And we all looked at each other and we all started going, come on, Bart, you can do it, you can do it, one more, just one more. And he stopped and like a diva, he slowly turned and he looked at us as if to say, oh, all right, one more. And he sauntered back to set and he did it and he nailed the shot. So thanks to Bart and the collaboration of everybody on the crew, we were able to finish the scene. And here's a little piece of it. I spoke your last, be quiet. Somewhere around. 
fucking performance. Stop running and fight! A wooden sword? So you've gone. You gave her a wooden sword. You've only got one bear. I'll pay her bloody ransom. Gold, sapphires, whatever you want. Just get her out of there. Oh, you lords and ladies. You still think that the only thing that matters is gold. Well, this makes me happier than all your gold ever could. And that makes me happier than all her sapphires. So go buy yourself a golden hand and fuck yourself with it! that you have to push yourself beyond your comfort zone in order to realize your passion in life and that you should continue to do so and challenge yourself all the time. I believe, the tr this, I believe that the same is true for storytelling. You have to think out of the box. Expose yourself. Be willing to fall. And if you do, pick yourself up and try again. Put yourself out there creatively. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't but you only live once, so why not take a risk? And the last thought I want to give you guys is go home tonight and write yourself a letter. Write down your aspirations, your dreams, your desires. Seal it and open it in 10 years. You might surprise yourself. Thanks very much. <laughs>